Good evening. Good to see everyone out this evening. I tell you, we're blessed, folks, to be able to come out to the Lord's house. Amen. I'm thankful for it. And uh, I just hope and pray that, that everybody's looking for something from him tonight. And the folks that are looking online, I pray the Lord give you a blessing also. Uh, Brother Terry Golden, would you lead us in prayer, please? If you would stand and get your All-American Church hymnal, we'll turn to page number 213, where we'll never grow old. Jesus Christ. Amen. Page number 169, tell me the story of Jesus.
story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God in the highest, peace and good story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Fasting alone in the desert, tell of the days that are past, how for our sins he was tempted, yet was triumphant. story most precious sweetest that ever was heard love those old songs folks they're good old songs amen lord bless you be seated amen good to be here and good to have everybody in this house we have some folks visiting with us tonight you folks here where you all from Pennsylvania, South Carolina. Well, good to have you. Good to have you. Anybody else with us tonight, first time? All right. We're glad you're here. Folks watching by uh, online right now, we're glad to have you. Make yourself at home with us. Join right in with service here tonight. It's good to know the one who changes not. That's what he said. Immutability. I am the Lord. I change not. Amen. All right, let's see here tonight. Now, day's the fifth. Jesse Howe is going to be singing for us tonight.
song, don't you think? Yes, sir. How great thou art. It's amazing when you think about what I'm getting ready to do here, Psalm 139. It's almost like there's somebody a whole lot bigger than us that's watching over a lot of this. Do you know what? Yeah. Yeah. Psalm 139. Thirty-ninth Psalm. 
O Lord, capital L-O-R-D, Jehovah, covenant-keeping God, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compasseth my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Father, bless this holy word. Bless the book now. In your name I pray, amen. You can be seated. If you, uh, if you do any reading and read commentaries and so forth about the 139th Psalm, you'll find that without, probably without exception, when they get to this psalm, they can't, they can't heap enough praise on it. This is one of the most powerful psalms in the whole Bible. It's, 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 some of them say it's magnificent. The 139th Psalm says to the chief musician, a psalm of David. Yeah. This is the shepherd boy, and look how he writes. Yeah. It's quite remarkable. If he wrote this, and I believe he did, I believe what the Bible says, then it's obvious that God gave him skill in writing and expressing himself. And the scripture says that uh, no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So therefore the word is God breathed. The Greek word for that is theos, theos, God, noustos, pneuma, God breathed. God breathed his word. Just like he breathed life into Adam, we are creatures of breath. Man is associated with breath from Genesis to Revelation. Yes. The life of a man is focused on his breath. The life of an angel has nothing to do with breath. I just mention that for you to think about what we're talking about here tonight. So the Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter number 7 and verse 18, here's what David said, if you want to turn there, 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse number 18. Then went King David in and sat before the Lord, and said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house, that thou hast brought me hitherto? Yes. You brought me from the sheepfold, wow. and here I am as an absolute monarch. And what do you mean by that? I mean he had absolute power, folks. Right. That's a king in those days. Power of life and death was in his hand. And so he's saying in humility, You've brought me to this point. And who am I? Why did you pick me? It's not because of any special thing that I have. Every gift I have, I received of the Lord. What do we have that we didn't receive of the Lord? If you have a gift, God gave it to you. Right. Amen. So he writes for us. The 139th Psalm looks at the omniscience, the omnipresence, and the omnipotence of God. In other words, omniscience means that he knows everything, Omnipresence means that he is everywhere. Yes. And omnipotence means that he is all powerful. And there's no way for us to judge that. We can't do that at all. So the scientific world, if you want to call it that, tries to discern how everything came into existence and they go back to a big bang. Yes. I never could figure out what did the banging. But in any event, this is where they go. They go back to the big Anything, anything but believe in an almighty, absolute creator being. Right. It's hard for a creature like me to take in that kind of power because all you have to do is look up to the created universe or look into a DNA cell, deoxyribonucleic acid. Look at it, or RNA that takes that DNA code and applies it. The very code of life is written, a double spiral helix connected with little things that look like ladders. Four of them, they only fit in one socket. You can't mix them up. So when you split that D, you split that spiral, and that's what they can do. You split it. If you put it back together again, it has to come back together again exactly into the sockets for those four, uh, four uh, what they, I forget what they're called, but you can look it up. Uh, there's four names for them. And that's, of course, you know, Mother Nature's smart, isn't she? I mean, good night when you think about how smart Mother Nature is. It's quite a remarkable thing. And this is what the psalmist is saying. He's saying, he's saying, Lord, he's saying, 
You've searched me and known me. You know my down-sitting, my uprising. You understand my thought afar off. You know what's going through my mind. Now, what he does here is gives you an Old Testament uh, uh, kind of a revelation of the nature of God as far as he understood it. And what you have is good. Verse 3, thou compassed my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. You know me. You know exactly. You know why I do what I do. And if I don't know why I do what I do, you know, Lord. And David has a reason for all of this, but he's talking to God. Now, think about somebody here. This is a warrior. Solomon was no warrior. He never fought a battle in his life. But David was a warrior. He went to battle, yeah. and they fought, and he had courage. When he went before Goliath, he was, that was courage, dear friend. You might say it's foolhardy. Not at all. No. He said, you come to me with a sword and with, with a stave and all of that. I come to you in the name of the Lord. Amen. And his weapons are not what they wanted to give him. He said, I haven't tried them. I haven't proven them. So he used what he had proven. What? A simple sling. Yeah, a simple sling. He had proved it. But if you read over there in the book of, uh, uh, in the, in the, about, the, about the Benjamites, the book of Judges, you read about the Benjamites. Uh, how many of you remember reading over there where they could take a sling and they could hit something a hair's breadth with it? Yeah. You're talking about 3,000 years ago. Oh, yeah. So don't cut them short. They could take that sling, and you talk about the speed of a sling, well, you knock your head off. Yeah. They knew what they were doing. Yes, sir. So David, when he took that sling, he knew where he was, what he was going to do. He knew where he was going to plant that. But this is God's omniscience. It's his omniscience. Lord, thou hast searched me, and you know me. Yeah. The word searched is uh, akin to uh, where you weave things together, uh, embroidery or something of that nature. In plain words, he says, you've pierced me through. You've gone to my very, you've gone to the bone and marrow of what makes me who I am. The old pagan said, know thyself. Well, you know, the truth is, it'd be good for us to know who we are. Yes, it is. Have you ever noticed how it's so easy to see the other fellow's problems, but you can't see your own? Oh, yeah, that's easy. We all have that vision. But David, he looked at this and he said, this is, this is quite remarkable. He said, uh, he said, uh, this is something, look at verse number six. He said, such knowledge is too wonderful. It is too high. I cannot attain unto it. He said, I can't reach that. He said, there's no way I can understand it. He said, I believe it. He said, you know me, Lord, you know me. In plainer words, he said, you know why I did what I did to Uriah. You know why I did what I did to, with Bathsheba. And you know, you understand all of that. You know it. You know, the problem with humanity is that we do stupid things sometimes. We do foolish things. And uh, we really do. And, and we do things that we have criticized other people for doing, and we wind up doing it ourselves. That's right. That's the weakness and frailty of a human being, the human flesh. That's why the Bible said put no stock or put no confidence in the flesh. You can't trust it. You've got to reach up to somebody bigger than you to keep you from falling. You can't keep yourself up. Because what's going on deep, deep, deep down inside your soul, you don't know, but God knows. You ever notice how that even though he knows all of that and he knows who you are, where you came from and what you're going to do, he still wants to walk in fellowship with you? That's quite a remarkable thing when you think about it. <coughs> in uh, chapter number 16, uh, 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 Genesis chapter 16, verses 13 through 14, I want you to notice what happens here. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Wherefore the well was called Birhalah Roy. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. Now who did that? Who called that well by that name? That was Hagar. You remember, she didn't get along too well with Sarah. There was a little friction going on there. And they had argued, and she ran off. She ran off, but God met her. And here's what's happening. She is so amazed that the God of Abraham, she's an Egyptian, but that the God of Abraham cared enough about her to come out there and speak to her and show her who he was, that it literally blew her away. Do you know you don't have a corner on God? We don't own him. No. We don't own him. No, no, no. There's only one God, folks, just one, just one. Amen. 
Just one. Hear you, O Israel. The Shema, Deuteronomy chapter number 6. Hear you, O Israel. The Lord your God is one Lord. Amen. Amen. Just one. Yes. In other words, the Muslim does not have his God, the Jew his God, and the Christian his God. There's just one God and one Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is God manifest in the flesh. That's the only one and the only way that you'll ever go to God the Father. You see, he sees all, he knows all, he understands what's on your tongue before you ever say it, and then before you've ever spoken it, he knows what you're going to say when you say it. And that, my friend, is something that ought to make you think tonight. He knows what's on your tongue. Now, not only does he know, but look at verse number 8, Psalm 139. If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. You see, this is called omnipresence. You remember what I told you this past Sunday? How many of you remember what I was talking about when I was talking about time, past, present, and future? And when Satan showed the Lord Jesus Christ all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, he showed them to them. And he said, all of this has been given to me. Well, what did he show him? Did he show him all the kingdoms of the world that were in existence at that time? Or did he open up the future and show him what God had given him of the future time? You see, the Bible said, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. It's been one war right after another. You think the wars are over? No. 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 Oh, no, 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 no. They're lined up. The next one's already in vogue. It's coming. It's coming. But you see, if he's able to show him what's in the future, future, like John on the Isle of Patmos was caught into the future. Well, if a creature, and Satan is a creature, and so is John, if a creature can go into the future and look down upon the earth during the tribulation, what do you think Almighty God can do? He is not limited by time or by space or by any of the things that limit us. He's the Almighty. And that tells me something tonight. He's bigger than I can comprehend. So he said, he said, if I make my bed in hell, thou art there. Now somebody come, a scholar will come along, he'll say, Well, that word Sheol, I haven't even looked it up, but it probably is. And he'll say, so since it's that, there's no literal hell. Really? That's the word in the Old Testament it used for the unseen state of the dead. That's what it meant. And Jacob, when he went down into Sheol, he went down there sorrowing, but he didn't go down to the burning part where they suffered like the rich man. And so when this writer says, if I make my bed in hell, you're there. You can't even get away from him if you go to hell. Now, that's a thought, isn't it? And that's something to think about tonight, too. Are you going to hell? Are you really? You say, I don't, there is no hell. What do you base that on? Tell me. You have science for that? That there is no hell? Think about that for a moment. Think about it. To die and go to hell, man. That's something to think about. The writer said, if I'm, if he said, he said over here, if I ascend to heaven, thou art there. It doesn't mean God has to go there. It means he is there. That's omnipresence. That's omnipresence. So um, he's getting a hold of it. Nine, if I take my wing, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. So he starts off that with God's knowledge of him. Then he moves into God's power, his presence, where he can be. If I say, verse 11, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Yes. You see, creation, the laws of physics mean nothing to him. I mean, nothing to him. Light and dark, that's nothing to him. Nothing. He's not bound by that. He's not bound by 
the gravity or what have you. He's not bound by it. He's the one who made the laws of physics. Yes, he did. And this is what the writer of Psalm 139 is saying. And he's going to be, this is going to lead you somewhere. He said uh, in verse number 13, For thou hast possessed my reins. Now he goes in and gets very personal about how he got here. He said, you've possessed my reins. Now that's quite a thing. He said, thou hast possessed my reins. In other words, what makes me who I am and what I am. Uh, David's saying, I'm a human being. Now, can you imagine a man talking like this 3,000 years ago? Long before they understood near as much as they, do, as, they, as they did just, say, 50 years ago. Now we've got, we, have, we know so much more with DNA and the rest of that. But back then, they didn't know anything about that. But he knew what a child was in its mother's womb. Yeah, once that uterus became a womb, he knew what that was. Yes, he did. And he said, he said, you've possessed me, my reins. You've covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. He gets now into the, uh, into the mind of God, because God had a reason for making him. There's not another one of you ever has existed or ever will exist. There's not another one of you anywhere. You are a unique individual tonight. That means that God made you because he made you to be you. I don't have to be you. You don't have to be me. You are who you are. You're a unique individual. Yes, you are. And that's quite remarkable because right now we're pushing 8,000 million people on this earth. you know that? Yeah, 8 billion almost. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, that's a pile of people, folks. Amen. Yeah, 8 billion people. Good night. And he knows every hair on every head of every last one of them. He knows every thought that's going through every single mind of every one of them. He knows every deed that's ever done in all their life. He knows exactly where they came from, how long they'll live, where they live now. He knows every breath they've taken in their lifetime. He knows every sin they've committed. He knows every deed they've ever done and why they did it. And Christ died on the cross for all of it. That he might take away sin by the sacrifice of himself. This is what David is saying. He said, you know me. You possess my reins. He said, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well. Here's what one man says. He says, we know that every living creature is made up of microscopic cells. Each microscopic cell is a world in itself containing an estimated 200 trillion tiny molecules of atoms. Each cell, in other words, is a micro-universe of almost unbelievable complexity. Amen. Just one cell. One cell. One cell. All these cells put together make up a living creature. Each cell has its own specialized function. Each works to an intricate timetable which tells it when to grow, when to divide, when to make hormones, and when to die. Every minute of every day, some three billion cells in the body die, and the same number are created to take their place. During any given moment in the life of any one of these cells, thousands of events are taking place, each one being precisely coordinated at the molecular level by countless triggers. The human body has more than a million million of them, a million in each square inch of skin, 30 billion in the brain, billions of red blood cells in the veins. Obviously, such a complicated, unerring development of cells cannot possibly be the result of chance. chance. Amen. Amen. He created me, David exclaims. He made me. He had his theology right, didn't he? 3,000 years ago. You think about the Jew now. 3,000 years ago makes it very simple. There's one God, and I exist because he created me. Amen. You go and check into these pagan religions out here, and nothing like that. They believed everything under the sun. And so what you have here, I don't find one thing that I differ with. Do you? No. I agree with everything he said. Yes. It's just as relevant today. It's just as current now. Yes, it is. 
<coughs> as it was then. Now look at verse 17. Now let's, let's, before we jump there, let's go back to verse 14. I'll praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. My soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, the book of life, written which in continuance were fashioned. Now watch this. When as yet there was none of them. In other words, I didn't exist. You see the foreknowledge of God here? He said, I didn't even exist. But God had it already laid out. Written down. Written down. <laughs> Moses said, Lord, take my name out of that book you've written. He knew what he was talking about, didn't he? And God was not going to take his name out. Now look at verse 17. How precious are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. Isn't that a wonderful thing? How precious are thy thoughts unto me, O God. He thinks about us. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11 says this. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. If you put your life in the hands of the Lord, it can't do anything but be better. And you cannot fail. In Psalm chapter 40, verse 5, it says, Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. My God. He said there that every, everything that could possibly happen to you that comprises your life, he's already thought it out. That's what he says. Amen. That's quite a thing, don't you think? Yes. yes, it is. His thoughts toward us. How precious, David said, are thy thoughts toward me. Verse 18, if I could, should count them, they're more in number than the sand. When I awake, I'm still with thee. Yeah, the sand. My goodness, who in the world would even attempt to count the sand in this globe? In verse 19, Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies." Now, what you're doing here is going back into Old Testament law. You're going back to a time when there was a clear distinction made, very clear. God did not want them to mix with any of the pagan people around there. He said, if you mix with them, they'll drag you off into their religion. So they had to build a wall about them. But if you remember when the Lord Jesus showed up, he said, you have heard it said, you have heard it said, you have heard it said. And that in itself is a, is a complete message to show you what the Lord Jesus Christ said is how he applied what it was then and then it was in his time because he said, but I say unto thee, but I say unto thee, but I say unto thee. So before you pounce on something like this that David says and jump up and start preaching it to people, make sure that you understand how it has progressed into the New Testament, into this age of grace, and you're not back under the law. But I think you all understand that tonight. But look at verse number 23. Now, after saying all of that, here's the point. Here's the point. He said, he said, you know my thoughts. He said, you know where I came from. He said, you got all power. He said, there's nowhere I can go to hide. He said, if I go, if I ascend to heaven, you're there. Make my bed in hell, you're there. I can't get away from you. I, I make a difference how hard I run. It's, it's in vain. You know everything there is to possibly know about me. So David comes to a conclusion. That's what this is. He considers all of that, and then he makes this statement, and it puts it in context now. See, it makes, it makes a lot of sense when you see it that way. Here's what David said in verse 23. He said, I want you to search me, Lord. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, 
and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Well, he's already done that, yes, but here's what he's saying. Let me know. <laughs> Search me and let's talk. That's what this is about. He says, I want to walk with you, but I need for you to tell me what's, what needs to be done. This is the communication. This is what we have in 1 John, remember? In 1 John. This is one I've borne down on time and time and time again. Here's the bottom line, folks. If you don't preach 1 John, you're not in fellowship. Period. Now, you know, I'm not trying to make people mad. I'm just trying to preach the Bible. But if you'll turn over here to 1 John. 1 John, chapter number 1. All right, here we go. First John 1. All right. Verse 7. First John 1, 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, what light? The light that he gives you on your path. The opening up, search me, O God, and try me and see if there be any wicked way in me. Yeah. David's asking for light. That's what he's asking for. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son. See the word cleanseth? It doesn't say has cleansed or will cleanse. It says cleanseth, present tense, okay? Present, active, indicative. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If you, if you think that just because your carnal mind and your, decei your, de your de deceiving heart has not pointed out to you that there's something wrong between you and God, then everything's okay. What's happening? You're trusting yourself to be able to discern what only God can discern. Are you following me on that? That's important. Now look at verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth's not in us. If we confess our sins, the word confess is a simple word. Hama lagia. In plain words, I agree with you, Lord. No excuses. I don't hide behind what somebody else did. You say I did it, I agree with you. Amen. I agree with you. That's all. That's what it's saying. I agree with you, Lord. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just. See the faithful and just? Yeah. To forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now look at verse 10, and this is the sense. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. See that? Yes. Now there's an, you'd be better off robbing a bank than you would calling God a liar. And I'm not telling you to rob a bank. But I'm telling you that there are things that you would be far better off doing than calling the Almighty a liar. Amen. Why? Because you're, talk, you're speaking directly, personally to his character. That's everything. That's his character. And if God's character is not pristine, if it's not perfect, then there is no relationship. There never will be a relationship. Amen. You see, the Bible says that Satan is a liar. Yes. He was a liar from the beginning. Right. When he speaks the truth, when he speaks a lie, he speaks what he is. He abode not in the truth. He speaks of his own. He's a liar. Yes. A liar lives in a make-believe world. How, can, how so, preacher? Because a lie can never stand on its own, and it never deals with the real facts. There, it must always be followed by another lie. Yeah. Yeah another lie and somewhere that liar is going to be caught that's right a liar you remember when Gehazi lied to the prophet oh the prophet's soul was he said oh how my heart went with you Gehazi because he went back to Naaman and told him well my, my servant said well we do need some money for such and such and Naaman was more than willing to give him whatever he wanted and so he lied and he got caught in it. 
So if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. This is what David said. He said, Lord, search me, try me. See if there's a wicked way in me. If there's something in there that my carnal mind and my deceiving heart is not able to pull out and see, I'm going to trust you to show it to me. And you, when you do, I'm going to confess that you're right and you're telling the truth and I'm going to agree with you and I'm going to confess it to you and I want to walk in fellowship with you and I'm going to trust that the blood of Christ is going to cleanse it when I confess it. And this is why he said it's faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What we do is we let it build up and build up and build up and build up, start making excuses, start comparing ourselves with ourselves. And, you know, that's, he said, you're not wise if you do that. Well, I know so-and-so, he got away with it. Or, you know, what's, when's God going to chasten him? Or this and that and this and that, all kinds of stuff. And instead of doing what you should do at, the, at that moment, don't let it build. Don't, don't let it fester. Don't let it cook. Do it right then. Confess it. Amen, boy. I mean, I tell this woman jerk ran in front of me, and I got so mad. I said, well, I'm going to tell you the truth, son. <laughs> but it wasn't 30 minutes. I'm telling you right now, I, I was confessing. It was eating me alive. See, even Preacher Lawson, yes, sir, buddy, I'm just like you. And when I confessed it, hallelujah to God. Birds started singing again. Sun, sun started shining. My salvation, <laughs> the joy of the Lord returned, came back to me. It's a shame what you give up for the joy of the Lord, isn't it? Some little Mickey Mouse cheap junk, and it cost you the joy of the Lord. How precious is the joy of the Lord? Well, it's everything. It's your strength, right? And yet you'll let some nothing rob you of your joy. Yeah, it did. That's my, I, I need to pray about temper. Lord have mercy. And, you know, say, well, I don't have a temper. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> we'll find out all about your temper. In fact, you don't, we, about all of us have a temper, some worse than others. And I do, yeah, it, I, yeah I have, I've had in trouble. I've, been in, I've gotten in trouble because of my temper. And I ask God tonight, help me. And, uh, and he's there. He's good. He's good God. Everything I've ever done in my life, I've done it. But thanks be unto God, he can cleanse you and forgive you of it. Amen. I'm not a soul on this earth I blame for the kind of life I lived. For 27 years, I lived like hell. And then God saved me. And I don't blame anybody for the way I live for 27 years. Amen. I did it. My fault. I accept responsibility for it. And I asked God to forgive me for it. And he forgave me for it. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And that's the way you have to stay right with God. How many agree with that tonight? How many of you need to be down here in this altar right now? <laughs> We're real. I mean, it, real, real is real. And you can have fellowship with reality and you come out of this balloon and this religious uh, garbage and just own up. That's what my grandfather used to say, boy, right before he got, gave me a, a whipping, he said, own up to it. <laughs> How many's ever heard that? Yeah. Own up to it. <laughs> he did. He said, you don't blame me. You own up to it. It's yours. <laughs> I said, oh, it's mine. Okay. And so <laughs> got a whipping. Amen. I didn't get enough. I should have gotten more. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. When I was in grammar school over here on Beaumont, the principal, the principal took me back in his office one time. He said, line up. <laughs> he pulled out a board about that long. I said, oh, me, what did I do? <laughs> Bend over. <laughs> Well, you can hear that lick echoing off the walls of Beaumont Grammar School. You think I learned anything? When I got the rule, I got the same thing up there. I know at least twice, maybe three times. The sound was bouncing off of the walls. How many of you ever had anything like that happen? Don't, sometimes it takes, it takes a while to learn, doesn't it? Amen. Learn your lesson. Amen. Father, bless your word. Thank you for the time we have together, Lord. Most of all, well, thank, thank you for, you for honesty. honesty. People, people, people instead of blaming, blaming each other and blaming life. everything in the world, they just accept the responsibility for what they've done and walk in fellowship and communion with you. Thank you, Father, for David, Lord, and this great testimony he gave us in Psalm 139. Yeah. What a thing. What a, what a marvelous thing. The 139th Psalm. Yeah. 
Thank you, Father. We ask you to bless now in Jesus' name. For his sake I pray. Amen. Amen, amen. All right. Anybody like to come pray? You're welcome to come and pray. I don't like, uh, uh, what's the word for it? It's ritual. I'm not big on ritual. I'm big on, big on freedom. If you at any time while we're preaching or doing anything, choirs singing or whatever, if you feel like God wants you to get up, you come on down here. Amen. Amen. Just come on down and pray. Maybe somebody else would like to come down and pray tonight. Maybe, maybe, maybe somebody else in here has got a temper like me. And you've been running around and hiding and trying to make excuses for it and say, well, I didn't really mean it and this and that. Own up to it. Amen. You did it. Get peace with God. He'll forgive you for it. Amen. He'll cleanse you. He'll cleanse you. And then you can walk in fellowship with the Lord. I'd like for everybody in the house tonight, if you're saved, and I hope you are, I'd like for everybody in the house tonight, when you walk out of here, walk out with the joy of the Lord. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Don't leave out of here beat to death, dragging a load of baggage with you. Walk out with the joy of the Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm going to pray. Anybody else want to come down while we pray? I'm going to pray. Let's pray. Such a, such a blessed privilege. You know, I've told you a thousand times, you're getting ready to do something that angels don't do. That's right. If they do, it's not recorded in the Bible. So what does that mean? Prayer is far more than talking to God. Prayer is coming in essence in communion with God. It's talking to him on a level that you can't get to any other way. It's what you're able to do and nothing else can do. That's what prayer is. That's what we're going to do. Father, we thank you. Thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless his righteous name. Lord, we know who saved us. We know who, it's, we know who matters. We know how there's only one way to approach thee and to come into your presence tonight. And that's the blessed Son of God. We exalt him and we lift him up. We magnify his holy, holy name. Father, we pray for all the dear souls who've come tonight. Lord, I try to minister your word. I try to minister it now through prayer. There may be some in the house tonight that they've been, Satan has beaten them to death. He's filled their heart full of lies, deception. He's even built a wall between them and God. Father, tonight I pray you'd begin to tear that wall down. Tear it down. Tear it down. Now, Heavenly Father, let them feel in their soul how that your thoughts toward them are good. That if God be for us, who can be against us? And Heavenly Father, help them understand that tonight, that you're for them. You're for them. Lord, if you're not for us, we don't stand a chance. Well, we couldn't even breathe. You've been good to us. You're good and you're gracious and you're long-suffering and you're merciful. I pray in the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, that you'd cleanse tonight. Cleanse our Heavenly Father. The blood of bulls and goats couldn't do that. It would only push it forward another year. But when Christ died on the cross, Lord, he paid the sin debt. He paid it and paid it in full. And now his blood cleanses from all sin. Bless them. Cleanse their conscience. Give them a clean conscience. Move in their heart. Fill their heart with joy. Heavenly Father, the problems, they may have burdens tonight. They may have brought burdens to you. Stuff is weighing them down. Satan may be using these burdens to drive them further away from thee. Our Heavenly Father, let the Holy Ghost move in their soul and let him, let him make it real where you tell them, cast your care upon you for you care for them. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that tonight. I pray for them. Pray and bless them. Lift them up, Lord. Help them. Our Father, we pray for those that are watching out there. My Father, and I'm sure many of them are praying at this moment. And it's a wonderful privilege. What a thing. That we can talk to God. We can come with boldness and assurance by a new and living way. We cast our care upon you and call upon you. For you said you'll answer us, show us great and mighty things we know not. Bless them now. Bless them. Pray for the burdens in the families. You know my family. You know my burden. You know my heart, Lord. You know where I've been grieving for some time now. I call on your name, Lord. You know, Lord. You know. You know. I pray now, and I pray for their families. I pray for whatever need they have. We ask it in Jesus' name. Blessed be the name of the Son of God. Bless his righteous, holy name. 
in thy name I pray. Amen. 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 I've heard the illustration given where it says, cast your care upon me or cast your care upon him for he careth for you. It's a picture of the fisherman out there on the Sea of Galilee with his net. He cast it out upon the water. And that's the way God wants us to cast our problems upon him. Just let him go. Let him go. We take a, if you have a prayer request tonight, we take that before we go home tonight. Somebody have one? Yes, ma'am. Patsy Beck. That's what I thought you said, her stepmother. All right. Amen. Okay, anybody else? Yes, sir. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Johanna? What'd she say? Her mamma. Okay. All right. All right. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. He's in a bad way right now. Yeah, amen. All right. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Amen. Good. Show she might put a little stock in prayer then. That's a spiritual thing. Yeah, good. Okay. Yes, ma'am. This youth uh, youth event Friday night, July seventh, six to eight thirty, uh, ages ten to teens. You're all welcome. Amen. All right. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am.
Yes, ma'am. All right. All right. Anybody else? All right. Unspoken question tonight. See a hand. Yes, sir. So stand up. We'll have word of prayer. We'll let you go. God bless you for coming, folks. We'll meet Sunday, 10 o'clock. Brother John Wright, will you dismiss us tonight, please?